Hi everyone, this is Peter Felfer again from the University of Sydney and today we're going to talk about one often neglected aspect of Adam Probe Analysis and that's how to get the hull of your data set. So there's actually no definitive answer of what the hull of a data set of points is just because there are a bunch of points. It's sort of like trying to say what you know like if you have a if you have a if you throw some marbles on the floor what's the area the marbles are in. It, there is no no real answer to that, no one answer to that. But there is actually um, some mathematical models that are trying to approximate what the boundary of a set of points is. And the most important one is the convex hull. And what a convex hull is, if you, if you imagine this is a bunch of points which could be, which could be an atom probe data set or could be something else, just a two-dimensional representation, and you're trying to fit sort of the closest set of lines or planes in 3D to this data set, which will then give you something that looks something like what I'm trying to draw here, obviously in a bit more, more detail. Um, and that sort of gives you a boundary between where the data set is and where it isn't. And this is, of course, it's called convex hull, so as the name suggests, this works very well for anything that's, that's convex, but we all know that Adam Prop data sets have start rate and an end rate is at least if you look at, if you're not cropping your data set if you're cropping your data set using a convex hull might be appropriate um, but actually what's what's more appropriate usually is using something called an alpha hull and what an alpha hull does is it uses spheres up to a radius uh, down to rates you should say down to a minimal radius of alpha and f uh, and and fits the closest spheres in and as you can imagine everywhere where they hold uh, the whole data set is convex, there's not going to be much difference from, from a convex hull. So here, the, uh, the, the sphere you'd fit will be sort of approximating what the convex hull would be. But here, where we have a concavity at the bottom of the data set, we'll actually need to fit um, something that has, curved, that has a curve here. And uh, I didn't work all too well, but you get the point. So instead of just using planes, we're using spheres. And this really approximates the data set pretty well. Of course, the, the difference between a convex hull and an alpha hull then is that a convex hull doesn't have any free parameters. There's only one, one single answer to it. There's no ambiguity. The alpha hull has the ambiguity that there is a radius of alpha that you have to choose. But especially when it comes to atom probe data sets, the choice of alpha doesn't actually change your um, your hull much. You'll just after this um, after the tutorial grab the um, um, grab the code, try to play around with it a little bit, try to change the alpha, and you'll see it's relatively straightforward uh, what choice of alpha you would you would have. Anyway, let's get started and uh, let's get an example going. So um, what we're gonna do is just load a post file in. Oh, sorry. So all of the in the, um, uh, on the on the web page on my web page you'll find with the tutorial you'll find all of those um, all of those algorithms to download .m files so you can use them in your MATLAB should work without any issues we've, we've been using them here for a while um, and I'll just use one of the tutorials um, tutorial data sets you can just go use one of your own. Load it into MATLAB, shouldn't take very long. There we go, it's about 8 million points. And uh, in order to create that data, the hull, um, we'll just have a look into the, the code. As you can see what the input and what the output is. So you can see the output is called FV, that stands for faces and vertices, which is a patch in MATLAB. So there's, it's a struct with FV.vertices, FV.faces. Anyway, very simple. And uh, we put in a post file, the alpha hull radius, so the maximum concavity, uh, the min, sorry, the minimum concavity radius that we're allowing, and what sort of sample size we have. Sample size in this case means we're not going to take the entire data set. It's just too many points. Uh, we take a sample, a random sample out of it, which usually represents a data set pretty well. Usually it takes 200,000 points. If you crank the sample size up, you'll get a more accurate representation of the boundary at the expense of computational time, and uh, also you'll get a, a 
you'll get some really small triangles. So 100, 200,000 points is turned out to be a pretty okay sample. So all we need to type in is fv equals, you can call the variable obviously however you want, sampled alpha hull, and we'll put our post file in as the input variable. Uh, and we'll put the alpha radius to 10 nanometers. That's usually a good value. If you think of an Adam Pro data set, may have a bottom radius of say th 60, 70, 80 nanometers, something like that. So we just need something that's a bit smaller than that. And 10 nanometers does a pretty good job. Uh, and we'll st we're not going to type it well. You'll type in a sample size, we can type in 200,000 by typing 2e5, but it's got that as a default setting anyway, so we can just leave that out, let it run, and you'll see just within a couple of seconds, we will have um, our data set how popping up. There we go. It's telling us what the volume is, and it's also showing us the data set how. And you can see this very much looks like an Adam Prop data set. And you can use this to do things like evaluate what the volume of your data set is, which is actually an input parameter of the reconstruction, but you might want to cross check. Um, and most of all, what we are going to be using it is uh, in a later tutorials where we'll show you how to create analysis objects, is to make sure that our analysis objects actually end the boundary, that they don't end before the boundary and that they don't extend beyond the boundary. Because especially if you do quantitative analysis, it's very, very important um, that your uh, analysis objects go right to the boundary and not beyond that. So this is, uh, this is so much, uh, this is it for the MATLAB part. But of course, you can see that the mesh is, eh, you know, it's got, it's, it's, it's got, it's got finer and it's got coarser parts. It's not the nicest mesh you'll ever come across. Um, but working with a mesh in MATLAB is not that easy anyway, so we're going to work with it in Blender. So if you just wanted to create the boundary, that's it for you. Um, if you want to know how to turn your boundary into a nicer boundary, because you want to use it for something else later, uh, and the boundary that you got first didn't, just didn't cut it, if it did, you're fine. If not, you might need to do a process that in computer graphics is called retopologize. So in order to export the um, um, the data is um, the, the data set hull, which is in the form of faces and vertices. We're using a very, very common file format called Wavefront OBJ. Pretty much any 3D software can read Wavefront OBJ and can write Wavefront OBJ. You could even drag and drop it into Photoshop. Photoshop will be happy with it. You can paint on it. You can, you know, go crazy. Um, or also, if you're, um, if you're publishing with LCVA, you can put, uh, include it in your... Um, if you have a reason to do that for uh, with dataset hull or later with other objects, you can include it with your submission, and people will able to view it in three D with uh, online with your with your paper because they've got a three D viewer. Anyway, so it's really easy to uh, to export it. So you just go patch to obj, and the patch we want to export is called fv. Uh, we can optionally give it a file name at the back. Um, or um, if you don't do it, it will pop up with your system's um, dialog box that you're very familiar with. And uh, we'll just add it to grain boundary where I think I might have a hull created already. Uh, yeah, so grain boundary hull exi um, exits, um, exists already. Let's just create a new folder so I can uh, delete it later. Boundary underscore hull safe. So if I then go and have a look at the file itself, you'll see that the file is actually very, very simple. It's relatively small size, and I've set them the, the files to the uh, to pop up straight away in a text editor because they are ASCII text files. And you will see that I have these and three coordinates after the Vs, which are representing the vertices of the mesh. And if you scroll down, you will eventually get to the triangles. So you can see the Fs 
um, have the indices of the vertices that are connected to form triangles. The only thing that's sometimes to be remembered is that it uses an O to delineate when your objects start. So that's important if you've got multiple objects in there. Doesn't matter too much now, but if you get error messages, like a program couldn't split up the objects, then it's because this is missing. So, okay, let's go and uh, do the Blender part of it. So I'll go and open Blender. I've had it open already. And in order to import a wavefront OBJ file, go File, Import, Wavefront OBJ. And go to the tutorial, click on it, and uh, at the import options, we'll go X forward and minus setup. You just always have to remember when you import and export what your reference coordinate systems are so that things, you know, unflipped left and right or up and down or whatever. So if you use multiple programs to do that, always make sure that, um, that you're consistent with the... Um, the import and export settings, and uh, there we go. Oh, I've already flipped the head flipped the data initially, so I might just go delete that. Import the way for an OBJ. Oh, damn it! Sorry. Um, import it again and go set direction up. So just that it points upwards. You can see this looks quite a lot like an Atom Probe data set. I think. Um, sorry. I've moved it, and we want to retopologize it. So in order to do that, moved it again. Sorry, I'm not used to I'm not used to using uh, the trackpad, which I'm doing right now. I'm usually using the mouse, and I'm finding things out while I'm doing this tutorial, which sometimes happens. Anyway, you can see that if you are we're going into edit mode by using tab. Sorry, I'll enable the screencast keys for you so you can see what I'm doing. So when you go into edit mode, you can see that the mesh, you know, locally sometimes has some pretty odd looking triangles in there, uh, which should not usually be a big issue, um, but it can be especially those ones that um, often referred to as topologically trapped, which means you've got essentially three triangles inside another triangle, rather than a nice triangle strip like here. Um, anyway, so what we can do is just press A to select all vertices, and as a first thing to do is remove all vertices that are fairly close together, so we'll just Crank it up to a level where we start seeing the mesh going a little bit. Well, where it doesn't represent the outline really well anymore. But you can see that you can actually draft it up to quite a fair bit beyond what it is now. I uh, just need to make sure that you don't lose too much detail down here or at the top but that looks quite okay and you can see that there's some odd shape ones here. Anyway, this is already uh, a little bit better and what you then need to do if you want to fix up the mesh, you can see that there's some triangles that are poking in the wrong direction. So I actually need to go and fix those up and you can see this, this is one of those where, you know, one points, you know, there's one it's on the wrong side. Um, but you can uh, you can imagine that that's a little bit of a um, little bit of a manual task. So very often the easy way to do it is use a modifier. So you go and open up modified. It's called remesh, and go to blocks smooth, which is essentially an ice surface really, um, and change the octree depth to a larger value so that you um, that your your hull actually represents um, represents your your data set hull pretty well and in order to to turn it into a mesh uh, you click apply and now if you have a look inside you can see that our mesh has gotten a lot nicer um, you can also manually retopologize, which is a lot more work. So the way you would do that is essentially 
um, by using a cylinder and um, shrink wrapping the cylinder. So I'll, I'll show you quickly how to do that. So you add a cylinder, scale it up 20 times, probably more than 20 times. Use a cylinder. Um, GZ, set it down. Put it here, as said, to make it larger. And then essentially what you would do is you would make you would need to make the the, the cylinder fit pretty well, but you get the point and then control R um, we'll cut and slide. So we'll just make it more cuts. So this is all a little bit harder with uh, that mouse. Okay. So now if we go outside, this is a subdivided one, and uh, we can go and use a shrink wrap modifier, target is the mesh, and shrink wrap the mesh. You can see uh, there would need to be a little bit of mesh cleanup later on because we've, uh, we've made a bit of a mess with the quads. Um, but essentially, that's how you would go about and, and retopologize a cylinder. If you actually do the reconstruction yourself, we're going to pretty soon publish a method that generates the hull while you're doing a reconstruction. That's of course a preferred way of doing it, but this is the, this is the quick way and we can do it with any data set and it does the job usually. Anyway, so this is, uh, this is one of the first tutorials for, um, for um, what we're going to be working on in terms of interface lattice mapping and other things and proxygrams and the like. Uh, and this is usually the word that the thing that I start out with, I create a hull for my data set. All right, so I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, go download the code and go and play around with the, uh, uh, with the methods.